Turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments. Once again, the Israelites are camped out at the base of Mount Sinai. They will be in this particular area for about one year. This is where God would meet with Moses and give them the law, and that's what we've been looking at. Uh, we saw that the Lord descended down upon Mount Sinai in fire and smoke, thunder and lightning. It says the whole mountain shook and trembled. But this is when God gives the people his moral compass, uh, his moral guide for this life. And in simple, very straightforward terms, he defines how the Jewish people are to live. In fact, it's how the whole world should live. And I think all of us would agree that this would be a much better world if everybody obeyed God's word. In other words, what a world this would be if we all worship the one true God, if we put our faith and trust in the Lord God Almighty, and we had no other gods before us. What a great world this would be if there was no murder, no sexual immorality, adultery, no lying and stealing, uh, coveting. But the problem is we obviously do not live in a world like that. And the further we get into these last days, the more it's going to be like it was before the flood uh, during the days of Noah. Our, our culture is becoming known for its biblical illiteracy and ignorance, and it's also known for its moral relativism. And uh, moral relativism just simply means most people don't know what the Bible says, and more and more people don't care what the Bible says. Most people just want to live by their own rules and standards and not by God's word. So we hear more and more people say there are no absolute truths. They make an absolute statement to try to say there's no absolute truths, but be that as I may, that's where our world is. Uh, there's no right and wrong, but we can all have our own truth and live however we want. And so it's just like in the days, and you read about it in the book of Judges in Israel, two common phrases, everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and the other one was, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So in their eyes, we're doing what we want to do. In God's eyes, you're blowing it. And God's eyesight is 100%, well, no, it's infinitely greater than our eyesight. And unfortunately, that is the perfect description of America right now. We're, we're doing what is right in our own eyes, even though it's evil in the eyes of the Lord. And the sad thing to me is how many churches are doing the same thing. They're accepting anything that the world says. Uh, many of you know who George Barna is. George Barna is the number one Christian pollster out there. And he simply says, the church in America is facing a crisis of biblical illiteracy, meaning that most Christians don't know God's word. For example, only one in 10 Christians can name five of the 10 commandments. One in 10. When asked what is the most well-known verse in the Bible, you would hope they would say John 3.16. For God so loved the world. The number one response to that question from Christians is, God helps those who help themselves. Not only is that bad doctrine, it's not even found in the Bible. Um, only two in ten Christians use a biblical worldview when making life decisions. And I place the blame for this mess that we are as a nation directly upon church leaders, elders and pastors who care more about being culturally relevant than being biblically relevant. They care more about nickels and noses than they do about rightly dividing God's word of truth, his holy word. They care more about not offending people than they care about offending a holy God. And so they put down the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which alone can rightly divide our hearts it rightly reveals the truth about who God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, which alone is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. And instead, they substitute God's word, and they start using worldly, fleshly philosophies of men, of sinful people in this world, to tell everybody, oh, you just need a hug, you need a pat on the back, tell how good you are and how wonderful you are, and just go on with your life. And they're doing a tremendous disservice to the Lord and to the body of Christ. They want people to leave church feeling better about themselves, even though they're living in rebellion against God. 
And men such as the one in Houston, Texas, is one of the main culprits. And he is just a, a pop psychologist that tries to make everybody feel good about living in their sin. It's horrible, it's wicked, and it's the state of the church today. But this is exactly why Paul instructed and exhorted Timothy with these words, 2 Timothy 4, look at these verses starting in verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. That's what they're doing right now, heaping up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth, the truth of God's word, and be turned aside to fables. But you, to be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so we need to stay biblically focused. We need to be biblically literate. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So this morning we pick up our study in Exodus with the commandment number eight. And what does commandment number eight say? Look at verse 15 of Exodus 20. It simply says, you shall not steal. Four very basic words, not really hard to understand. You shall not steal. In other words, do not take what does not belong to you. But boy, oh boy, has this commandment ever been abused throughout the world, and especially in our nation today. Just a couple of years ago, our liberal-run cities were pushing for defunding the police. God's number one command for governments that God established human government is to practice the law, obey the law, enforce the law. And so they've been saying defund the police and crime has started soaring, as you know, in many of these cities, especially shoplifting. And uh, some of these same people started decriminalizing stealing. I think California now up to, you can go in any store, take $950 worth of stuff and not be prosecuted. I mean, that is just unbelievable. Hey, let's go Christmas shopping in San Diego, you know? It's crazy. Don't be surprised if their governor tries to become the next president. And I would hate to think where our nation would be if we went that direction of California. I'm from there, and it's very sad to see what's happening there. Now, the legal definition of stealing is to take someone's personal property without permission or legal right or with the intention of not returning it. And theft and stealing is rampant throughout our world today. But it's not just taking things out of stores, but one of the number one crimes is stealing out of people's houses. Homes are one of the number one targets for thieves. So another industry rises up, personal protection. Some of you are armed and loaded. Uh, some of you have a lot of security cameras, and you know they're everywhere. We have them throughout our church, inside and out, security cameras. In fact, uh, Stanley, our head of security here, many of you know Stanley, uh, he's been able to help the police, uh, not what was done in our building, but across the parking lot, across the street, people that have broken the law, and he's been able to turn video over to them and help them bust people. Uh, yesterday, we had a great time. You guys did amazing with the bazaar. There was one incident, and I'll just say, I'll try to be vague about this, a 10-year-old boy. I guess that's vague enough. Uh, <laughs> it's funny when you think about it, um, but it's not. And we've already, con Bethany already contacted the parents. They're very upset what happened. So he went into the, or the toddler room down the hallway in the children's ministry during the bazaar, and he just trashed the toddler room. Just stuff everywhere. I mean, Play-Doh everywhere. He's like 10 years old. That was, you know, that was minor. Um, there's a camera. He didn't see it right above his head. And he goes into the room that's closed. And that's where part of the storeroom is for the children's ministry. And Bethany just happened to put the little children's agape box in there to hide it. And it had cash in it. And so the camera's looking down, and you see him looking, and he's looking at it. He gets a, you know, a little um, 
paper clip and he's trying to unlock the back of it. He starts shaking it. He gets his finger in there. He starts pulling out some bills. He finds a stick. It's all on camera. It's great. Stanley found it. <laughs> and uh, now if we were in a different country, we would probably cut his hand off or string him up. You know, we're not going to do that. Well, that's not part of the plan. But Bethany did contact the parents and they're really upset about it. So they're going to bring him down here. I said, don't bring him when I'm here. Make sure Stanley deals with him. And uh, he'll deal with him better than I will. Anyway, so he's going to be doing some work around the church and hopefully learn his lesson. So stealing is everywhere. Don't think, you know, I never stole any. Well, I stole stuff all the time when I was a kid. I mean, I can identify with that. If that was me when I was 10, I probably would have just stomped on it and taken all the cash and run. But, you know, that was a different time. <laughs> Stealing comes in all shapes and sizes, from counterfeiting money to cheating on tax returns to borrowing something from your neighbor that you never intend to give back uh, to employers not paying their employees for all the extra work they do to employers or employees being lazy in the job and then wanting overtime pay to our government leaders who will take money from law-abiding tax payers like us and then they end up with three or four multi-million dollar mansions. I wonder who does that. <clears throat> I won't say any names. Anyway, then there's identity theft, there's credit card theft, there's scam callers. Anybody been called by a Nigerian prince? I've had that happen a few times. It's like, who are you? Why do you want me to send you a thousand bucks? I mean, if you're a prince, get yourself out of your predicament. Uh, Sam Bankman Freed, some of you have been following him. He took billions of dollars and he is in all kinds of you know, legal trouble because of his illegal cryptocurrency scams. Again, look at our first, you know, or not our first, look at our government though. We are $33 trillion in debt. So we're continuing to buy things and you know, make things and take money for projects most Americans don't want. They're spending money they don't have. It was Ronald Reagan who once famously said, the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. <laughs> so true. But again, the Bible has a lot to say about stealing. Uh, God even accused the Jewish people of stealing from him. How did they do that? Well, it's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. The Lord says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? The Lord says, In tithes and offerings. In other words, they're taking credit for all the blessings that God had given them. They weren't remembering the Lord. And they were saying, Man, we've done all this. We're working hard. This is ours. And they don't acknowledge it actually was the Lord who was the source of all their blessings. And it's because stealing comes in all sorts of packages that we often try to justify it. And people will give all kinds of different terms to it to try to say, well, it's not really stealing. I'm actually, you know, just getting reparations or whatever it might be. This is what Paul tells, a, uh, tells Christians in Ephesus because none of us are immune to this. But Paul says to Christians in Ephesus, let him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So Paul is essentially telling us, now that you're saved, now that you're a new creation in Christ, now that you're born again, now that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, don't be like the unsaved world around you. The remedy for stealing is to honor God, to acknowledge that God is the source. He is the provider of all that you need. And then work hard, he says, develop a heart that's willing to share and give to those who are in need. In fact, one of the main evidence, evidences of being saved and truly repentant is that you stop stealing for other people. Remember when John the Baptist comes on the scene, he's down at the Jordan River baptizing, calling people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And all these different people are coming to him. And then this is what we read in Luke 3, starting in verse 12. It says, Then the tax collectors, they were not, well, they were a lot worse than IRA, I are IRS today, but the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall I do? He said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. In other words, stop gouging the people because tax collectors, 
They were required to take so much for Rome, and then they could pocket anything else they took from you. He says, no, just take what is appointed to you. Likewise, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, asked him, saying, what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone. The word intimidate means to shake down for money. That was a common practice among the Roman soldiers. Don't shake down for money. Don't intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. And be content with your wages. Remember when Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. I love that. It's like, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down from that tree. We're going to your house to eat. And it says in Luke 19, verse 8, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, he had. <laughs> if I had, no, he had. If I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so Zacchaeus was saved by trusting in the Lord, not because he gave back fourfold. It wasn't based on works. It was based on he trusts the Lord. And the evidence of his faith is that he wanted to restore, wanted to do what was right. Now, the greatest example of the penalty for stealing and thus breaking this commandment is seen at the crucifixion of Christ. How does that apply to the crucifixion of Christ? Well, you remember who was crucified on each side of Jesus. Matthew says two robbers were next to him. Some versions say two thieves were crucified on each side of Jesus. And so you only thought stealing that candy bar was no big deal. They were robbers, they were thieves, they were getting the death penalty. Well, that's a good picture of sin because the wages of sin is death. Well, I've never done all these big commandments. I've never broken those. doesn't matter. Any sin is worthy of death. That's why Jesus had to come and die for our sins. Uh, James 2.10 says you can keep the whole law, and yet you stumble in one point, you're guilty of breaking it all. So don't try to justify yourself by saying, well, I live by the Ten Commandments. Well, you can try all you want, but you're going to fail to live by them. And the Lord will show you very clearly that you haven't. But be that as it may, these two thieves, they're like everybody else around Jesus. They're mocking him. They're cursing at him. They're just, you know, if you're really the son of God, save yourself and us. And they're you know, mocking the Lord. And then what does Jesus say first thing when he's hanging on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Well, one of those thieves, the Lord's speaking to his heart. The Holy Spirit's convicting him. And so Luke 23 Starting in verse 42, then he said, this is one of those guilty thieves, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amazing. Doesn't matter how many sins you've committed, you commit your ways to the Lord, he will save you. You can commit a lot of bad, nasty sins, he's willing to forgive you of every sin. Well, I've never been that big of a sinner. Well, he'll forgive you of all your little sins because those will keep you out of heaven as well. He's willing to forgive anybody of anything and everything. So once again, we've all broken God's Ten Commandments, at least one of them, and the penalty for our sin is death. But God, John 3, 16, the, the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved a little kid that stole yesterday we're not here to condemn him we want to see that kid come to know wow I've blown it but they actually love me there's a God who loves me Jesus loves me yes and, and so we want to communicate that to him and his parents if they need to hear it so we'll see how that goes so anyway that brings us to commandment number nine Look at verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, this commandment is all about honesty as a believer. We are never to in intimidate, manipulate, deceive. In other words, do not lie about other people because you want to promote yourself 
or you want to put them down, you want to make yourself look better in the eyes of other people, that's wrong. And as you know, Jesus called Satan a liar. Jesus says he is the father of all lies, and he is the ultimate false witness against you. In uh, Revelation 12, it says that Satan goes before God day and night and falsely accuses you. He, he hates you, and he'll bring all kinds of accusations against you. So we should not be like the enemy in any way, shape, or form. In fact, being a false witness... It's one of the things God specifically hates. Do you know God hates certain things? Twice in uh, the book of Revelation, God's, uh, Jesus says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But there's things God hates, and very clearly. It's in Proverbs 6, 16. It says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, so you're just arrogant, a lying tongue, well, that's part of being a false witness, you lie. Hands that shed innocent blood, that's commandment number six, you shall not murder. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies, so that's breaking commandment number nine right there. And one who sows discord among the brethren, that's also contained in commandment number nine. You're sowing discord. Among the brethren, you're going around to other people trying to get somebody else in trouble or spreading gossip and rumors. False witnessing is rampant in the world. It's nothing new. People have always manipulated the truth to try and take advantage of other people or to try and get a, get a clear guilty verdict overturned. That's false witnessing. It's a perversion of justice. Our politicians and most of our news media today are constantly bearing false witness against other people. It's amazing how they'll manipulate things to make people look bad in other people's eyes. When a society becomes entrenched in being tricky with the truth, the end result is always the same. It leads to anarchy, and then that will lead to chaos. That's what Satan wants. He wants to lie, steal, kill, destroy. A sad example of bearing false witness is what the religious leaders did to Jesus Christ after they arrested him. Look at these verses in Matthew 26, starting in verse 59. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said... This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now, did Jesus say that? Pretty much. They twist his words, the meaning behind it, but this is a great example of taking the words of Jesus, twisting them just enough to come up with the wrong conclusion. Because Jesus was not talking about destroying the temple there in Jerusalem. He even goes on to say he's talking about his body. His body would be destroyed, but three days later he'd rise from the grave. By the way, that is what every pseudo-Christian cult does. You know what a pseudo-Christian cult is? They look like Christians. They talk like Christians. They might even act like Christians, but they're a cult. They're building a temple on Horizon Drive. Hint number one. They'll say, Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Or Jesus is the spear brother of Lucifer. Those are pseudo-Christian cults. They don't line up with the word of God. They take a Bible verse out of context. They create a false witness as to who the real Jesus is. And they'll come up with all kinds of weird ideas about who he is and how a person must join their cult in order, in order to be saved. All you need is God's word. You got the Holy Spirit in you. All you need is the Word of God, and He will lead you. He will guide you. You don't need me. You don't need anybody else but the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and He will never lead you astray. But being a false witness comes in many forms. Again, over-the-top flattery is wrong. It can puff people up with pride. Half-truths are nothing but full lies. There's no such thing as a half-truth. Political promises that never come to fruition. That's bearing false witness. Gossip is also a form of bearing false witness as you simply further fan the flames of falsehood. Let me tell you about brother so-and-so. 
Yeah, they really need a lot of prayer. Wow, what's going on? Well, let me tell you. And then pretty soon it's like, whoa, man, that guy's horrible. And then you don't even pray for him. It's like, let's condemn him. I mean, you got to be careful. Proverbs 25, verse 18 says, A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. You know, you heard the old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. No, this is just the opposite. Sticks and stones may break my bones, and words will certainly hurt me. That's what he's saying. These false rumors are like clubs. They're like swords. They're like sharp arrows that just pierce people. It hurts them. Again, when they were bringing false accusations against Jesus, how did he respond? It says that he opened not his mouth. Some versions say Jesus kept silent. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do. Be quiet. Let the rumor, let the gossip stop with you and let it go no further. Let false accusations stop in your presence and not go any further. So we need God's wisdom. We need wisdom to know when to be silent, but we also need wisdom to know when to speak up. God doesn't want us to be doormats. He wants us to speak the truth in love. We need to pick our battles wisely. And when we do speak up, that's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, speak the word of God in truth. You can speak forth the word of God in truth, but if it's not without love, or if it's without love, then you're just whacking people's heads off. You're just slicing and dicing. No, you need love. You need truth working hand in hand together. And when you genuinely love people, you will speak up. You'll tell them the truth. As believers, we must be people of truth and honesty, integrity, humility. Uh, I love what King David writes. He was broken. He was repentant after his sin. Psalm 51, verse 6. He says of the Lord, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. So we should all desire truth, not being a false witness. So that brings us to the 10th commandment, verse 17. This is, uh, this is a good one. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey. Is that an issue with anybody here? Are you just like, I got to have that ox. I got to have that donkey. Well, you'll see in a moment what it refers to. Nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now, this commandment is different from the other commandments that deal with our relationship with others. Remember, the first four deal with our relationship with God. No other gods before me. The, the final six all deal with our relationships with others. But this one is different because this one is in the inside. This one deals with our hearts. Don't covet. It begins in your heart. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Those are actions. But this one starts in the heart. A good definition of uh, covetous, covetousness is this. To be driven by ungodly desires for something that is not yours. In other words, you have this strong, ungodly desire to have what that other person has. Now, obviously, not all desires are wrong. A desire to get married, a desire to have children, a desire to have a good job to support your family. That's, that's a good desire to have. A desire to grow in your relationship with God, a desire to be in the Word and understand God's Word better. That's a great desire to have. So not all desires are wrong, but to covet something or someone that somebody else has, that is not good because it can lead to an unhealthy form of jealousy and envy. And again, those things can lead to murder and theft and adultery. Some people will become obsessed with something or someone that really does not belong to them. Now, coveting is at the heart of most advertising campaigns out there. Not all of them, but most of them, when you think that they're appealing to your flesh, trying to make you feel like, I need that. You know, you ever see the Holderness family? They've got video, they're cute videos. They got one on Costco. And it's, it's hilarious. Google Holderness family and Costco. 
I dare you. No. <laughs> I love Costco, but it's funny because the whole premise is, you know, um, I don't need it, but I want it, want it, want it. Costco. And they're going through the store getting these big giant bags of stuff they don't need. But anyways, you know what I'm talking about. And it's stupid. Commercials appeal to your flesh. Think of the ads for cosmetics, especially you women. Think of all the beer commercials. Think of the truck commercials. If you buy this product, you're going to look so beautiful, women. If you buy this beer, you're going to feel so great till the next morning. If you buy this truck, you're going to be the toughest, coolest guy around. I mean, that's what they appeal to. Okay, any of you... <laughs> I got saved November 30th, last week, 1977, 46 years old now. I look pretty old for 46, but anyway, 1977. So you got to go a few years before that. I got to make this qualification because I didn't do this after I got saved. But there was an aftershave commercial called High Karate. Any of you guys remember High Karate? It was, they did a bunch of commercials. If you wore it, then every pretty woman around would chase after you. And so they even put in their uh, package when you would buy a bottle of high karate uh, instructions that say that's why we have to put instructions on self-defense in every package. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> the stuff did not really work. <laughs> it kind of smelled a little funny. But I, I smelled it on other guys. So anyway, <laughs> but coveting, coveting comes with that desire, that longing for something that isn't yours and it isn't true. It arouses within us a lust after someone's position or power or wealth. So don't covet your neighbor's house. Oh, look at that house. It's so beautiful. I want that house. Be careful. It'll really distort your view of that neighbor or we'll talk about it in a moment don't covet your neighbor's wife if only i was married to her then i would be happy and that's not usually doesn't usually work out too well don't cover it covet your neighbor's male or female servants probably refers to your neighbor is a very successful business person and they have a lot of servants or we'd say employees they got a bigger business than I do. I covet that. I want more, you know, jobs. I want more, you know, notoriety. And so they would covet those employees. Don't covet your neighbor's ox or donkey. That would be your neighbor's tractor or your neighbor's transportation. The ox was their tractor. It would pull the plow in the field. The donkey was their transportation. So it applies. Don't you know, I wish I had that field to plow. I wish I had that tractor. Or I wish I had that car. I wish I had my neighbor's truck. I wonder if I can somehow wiggle something out of him and he'll give it to me. Be careful. Those things will start in the heart. Then God adds this general statement at the end of the verse. Don't covet anything that is your neighbor's. Now, do you know what the opposite of coveting is? The opposite of coveting is contentment. Contentment. It's so important that we learn to be content. Paul says it like this, 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You know, I've done a lot of funerals over the years, and I've never seen a hearse driving towards the, you know, the cemetery with a big U-Haul trailer behind it. You never see that. Unless you're weird and you're from somewhere in Texas, maybe, and they're going to put all their stuff in the grave with, uh, you know. I'm offending everybody today. <laughs> like Joel Osteen. I didn't mention his name earlier, but. <laughs> anyway, so don't. It is certain we can carry nothing out, so you can't take it with you. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire, and here's the word you, for coveting, those who covet these things, to be rich, 
fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So Paul is basically saying the key to contentment is keep it simple. Just enjoy what God has blessed you with. Yes, work hard. You get rewarded for that in our country. Nothing wrong with being a millionaire if you know Jesus and you're content with what he's doing in your life. But the goal to try to become that is the temptation that drowns men in destruction. You know, God blesses us and every one of us in this sanctuary today, we're all considered wealthy. Uh, you go to India, we would con be considered very wealthy. You go to certain parts of Africa, every one of us in here, very, very wealthy. So don't think of it like, well, I just need this and then I'll be happy. No, be content with what the Lord supplies and then you'll be happy in Him. You'll be content. You'll have joy. It's not how much you have because everything's going to burn. You know, we talk about that all the time. Second Peter 3, starting in verse 10, the whole universe is going to burn. It's going to melt with fervent heat. Jesus is going to create a whole new heaven and earth. So don't think, oh, if I just got that new whatever it is, it's all going to burn eventually. You can enjoy it while you have it, but don't hold on to it because you're not taking it with you. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4 says, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. This is exactly why Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So you seek the Lord first and foremost. And then let him bless you the way he wants to bless you. I've known Christians who are multimillionaires and they're miserable. I've known Christians who are multimillionaires and they're happy. Not because of their money. They're happy in Jesus. Their focus is on the Lord. I've known Christians who are very, very poor and they're miserable. Because they're all caught up in their circumstances. I know Christians who are very, very poor and who rejoice in the Lord every day. And thankful that the Lord is with them every day. When I go to India and we see how they live over there, so simple and the joy in their hearts, they're not striving for material things. They live day to day and they're happy. They've got joy in their hearts. It's a blessing being around them. So it's not how much you have or how little you have. It's your relationship with Jesus. That takes precedence over everything else. And again, God can bless us any way he wants to bless us. Now, the Bible is clear that coveting opens the door to a lot of other sins. And the classic example is King David. He broke commandment number 10. Everybody's going out to battle. It was in the springtime. He's up on his rooftop. He looks down. He sees Bathsheba taking a shower. I don't know how convenient that was. But it says, you know, in his heart, he starts coveting her. And so he brings her to himself. And he just committed one sin after another. He broke the first commandment by putting himself before God. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, David put himself before God. He then broke the seventh commandment by committing adultery with Bathsheba. And then he broke the ninth commandment by bearing false witness against Uriah. And then he broke the sixth commandment. You shall not murder by having Uriah put on the front line so he would be killed. And then he broke the Eighth Commandment by stealing Uriah's wife and marrying Bathsheba. In one act, starting with covetousness in his heart, he broke at least six of the Ten Commandments. He was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he did that? No, because he repented. He got his heart right with the Lord. James 1, verse 12. James 1, 12 says, Blessed is a man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, 
which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he te himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, lust, covetousness, and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, you give into that covetousness, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so covetousness is really a heart issue. Remember when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, he is going through some of the Ten Commandments because the Jews were so proud, the Pharisees, man, we keep the law. You know, we give, you know, one seed to God and we'll keep nine seeds to ourselves. So particular about keeping the law. And then Jesus challenges them by saying, you know what? You're all guilty of breaking God's law because you're doing the outward, but the heart isn't right. And at the heart of it is covetousness. Matthew 5, 27 and 28, Jesus makes this very clear how we're all guilty. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, these Ten Commandments, they're not given to us to make us righteous. They're not given so we can somehow make ourselves acceptable to God. If you think that way, you are wrong. And so many people are going to end up in the lake of fire because they're going to stand before God and say, I live by the Ten Commandments, and God will show them their heart. Sorry, you're out of here. You're in the lake of fire. Because you cannot keep the law. They were not given to us to make us righteous, but to show us how unrighteous we are. So Paul says this, Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, again, trying to keep the Ten Commandments, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. How would I know what sin is apart from the law? You know, don't touch the wet paint. That's the law. Well, what's the first thing we usually do? See if it's wet. I mean, we're, we're, that's how we're prone. The law reveals to us that we're sinners who need a Savior, Jesus. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You cannot be justified. You cannot stand before God in righteousness, declared righteous by God, but trying to keep the law. It's impossible. Galatians 2.21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if for righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. The simple fact that Jesus had to come from heaven to earth and die for our sins shows us that nobody can save themselves. If we could keep laws and make ourselves righteous, then why did Jesus come? The only reason he came is because sinners like us needed a Savior. In Galatians 3.24, this tells us why the law was given. Therefore, the law was a tutor, it's an instructor, to bring us to Christ. I'm a sinner, I need to be brought to the Savior so that's what the law does, a tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, now you're born again, you are no longer under a tutor. The law is now broken. No, the law is now fulfilled in your life because of Jesus. He alone fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. Look at the Hebrew language. Look at all the little strokes on there. That's the jot and tittle of the law. He fulfilled every one of it. Every perfect aspect of the Old Testament, he fulfilled it. The Old Covenant required the blood of sacrifice of animals. Jesus fulfilled all those being the final Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So we put our faith and trust in him alone. Again, the law is bad news in the sense it cannot save us, but it's good news because it points us to Jesus. He's the one that will save us. Religion cannot save you, but Jesus certainly wants to save each and every one of us. The law is simply a mirror. 
The law shows us our dirtiness. So you go out and work in your yard for the day in the summer. You're hot and sweaty and you get dirt all over you. And you look in the mirror and what does it show you? That you're hot and sweaty and dirty and need a shower. You start taking your face and go to the mirror. You're thinking, well, that was weird. I mean, I'm, you put your face on the mirror, you think that mirror is going to wash you clean. That's the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> no. You're like, that was bizarre. <laughs> and the, the, the Christmas bazaar ended yesterday. So anyway, no, you, you look in the mirror and it shows you. You're dirty. You need a bath. You need a shower. You don't try to take the mirror and clean yourself. That's the point. That's the law is the mirror. It shows you you're dirty. You need the rivers of living water to cleanse your heart, the Holy Spirit. You need the blood of Jesus to cleanse you, the Lamb of God. You need the Word of God to wash you clean. That's the Word of God. And so the mirror just shows us our need for Jesus. Amen?